Let's talk about Air Force One. No, the plane. You know, the Dwayne the Rock Johnson of the skies. It's both pretty and tough. Last week, Joe Biden was officially sworn in as the president of the United States after one of the most controversial, debated, and exhausting elections in history. And that's coming from a Canadian. And I know you have a lot of questions on your mind. Of course, the most pressing of all is who is Bernie's mitt stylist and how do I get in touch? Okay, the second most pressing of all is what do we know about Biden's alleged new ride? The $5.3 billion aircraft to replace the existing 747 Air Force Ones. Well, to answer that, let me first take you through a brief walk of the tumultuous history of the aircraft for the Commander-in-Chief. Let me unveil the shroud of secrecy surrounding the current 747s, well, at least as much as my internet research will allow. And finally, let's talk about the $5.3 billion aircraft to join the lineup. So let's get started. Curiosity Stream for sponsoring this video. For access to thousands of documentaries and my video streaming service, Nebula, check out the link in the description. Now, a common misconception that we should clear up right off the bat is the name Air Force One actually is a call sign for any aircraft carrying the US president, and not the name of the aircraft itself. Its family tree also includes Air Force Two, aircraft carrying the vice president, and Marine One, any Marine Corps aircraft, usually a helicopter that is carrying the president. And at one point, there was even a Navy One, when George W. Bush flew on an S-3 Viking to an aircraft carrier. Now, unfortunately, the trend of flying presidents in fighter jets didn't exactly catch on. All right, now back to our regularly scheduled programming. Now going way back in history, Franklin D. Roosevelt was the first president to fly in an aircraft while in office. In 1933, a Douglas Dolphin was furnished with four seats and a small sleeping compartment for presidential travel. And over the next decade, air travel quickly became a preferred mode of intercontinental transport, especially with the threat of German submarines hanging out in the Atlantic. Initially, a lot of these aircraft used for presidential travel were owned and operated by crews from airlines like Pan Am. But soon, the Air Force decided that it was much safer to convert existing military planes and have a dedicated crew of Air Force personnel. On their first go, the Air Force decided to convert a B-24 Liberator, a roomy aircraft with decent range. Just one problem though, the B-24 was a bomber aircraft, and shuttling the president abroad in a plane associated with nukes isn't exactly a great first impression. The Air Force in the end decided to go with the Douglas C-54 Skymaster, a four-engined transport plane that was derived from a commercial airliner, the DC-4. And this aircraft became technically the first Air Force One in history as we know it today. Except back then, it wasn't called Air Force One. It was given the nickname Sacred Cow after its predecessor, Guess Where 2. Now, I guess among the many fortes of the Air Force at that time, naming aircraft just wasn't one of them. But in the unpressurized cabin of this converted DC-4, there was a conference room, a fold-down bed, a refrigerator, which was a pretty uncommon luxury back in 1945, Five, and even an elevator at the back of the aircraft for Roosevelt's wheelchair. Now, following the sacred cow, presidential aircrafts have included the C-118 Liftmaster cargo aircraft and the Lockheed C-121 Constellation. The Constellation also became the first aircraft with the callsign Air Force One back in 1953 after a commercial airliner, Eastern Airlines 8610, crossed paths with Air Force 8610 carrying President Eisenhower. Following this incident, the nickname used informally by pilots officially became the callsign of the aircraft carrying the president. Now, throughout history, Air Force One has obviously been an icon of the presidency and America as a whole, but at some point, it's even been at the center of some major political events and controversies. And the most memorable one was probably the inauguration of Lyndon B. Johnson. On November 22, 1963, only two hours after the assassination of JFK, Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson was sworn in as the next president aboard Air Force One, still sitting on the tarmac at Dallas Love Field. 
27 people squeezed into the 16 square feet states room aboard Air Force One to witness this event. And in exchange for their personal space, they witnessed one of eight unscheduled inaugurations in history and the only one to take place aboard an aircraft. Now, in slightly lighter news, Air Force One also made the headlines more recently in 2009 during a photo op. During the photo shoot, the plane was seen circling the Statue of Liberty at a low altitude while being followed by an F-16. And New York residents who weren't made aware that this photo shoot was happening mistook the plane for another terrorist attack, and panicked New York residents lined the streets and buildings were evacuated. All right, so we've gone through the history of how Air Force One became Air Force One. So now let's talk about the specs of the current aircraft. Two modified Boeing 747-200Bs that's been a part of the presidential fleet since 1990. And as with most presidential transports, they also come in pairs, so that one is always operational while the other one is being serviced. There has also been rumors that at times, both aircraft will be in the air, so as to confuse potential attackers which one is the actual Air Force One. The triple-decked planes have over 4,000 square feet of floor space, including rooms like a medical suite that can turn into an operation room, complete with drugs, blood matching the president's type, and a doctor always traveling with the president. There are also two food galleys that can serve up to 2,000 meals, a presidential bedroom, numerous conference rooms, and first-class seating for 102 passengers. Now, these 747s not only got an interior upgrade, but they got some pretty cool performance enhancements too. For one, even without refueling, Air Force One has a slightly longer range than typical 200B models. But of course, they can also stay in the air almost indefinitely from aerial refueling. Technically, shortage of food on board would force the plane to land sooner than shortage of fuel. And unfortunately, there were some instances in history where Air Force One needed to put its agility to the test. For example, in 1974, as President Nixon was on his way to a scheduled stop in Syria, Syrian fighter jets intercepted Air Force One to act as escorts. Now, unfortunately, the Air Force One crew was not made aware aware of this and thought that they were hostile aircrafts, and as a response took evasive action, including a dive. The 747s also have heavy shielding installed to protect the wires and electronics from a nuclear blast. The aircraft also contains other defensive flares and even some rumored weapon systems, but as you might imagine, these juicy bits of info are not available to the public. As a further security precaution, Air Force One never uses any aircraft terminal or equipment and is fully self-sufficient, including the two pairs of its iconic retractable stairways. Now let's talk about the entourage of Air Force One, because of course, the rock of the skies needs some entourage. Typically, a C-141 Starlifter cargo plane flies ahead of Air Force One to deliver supplies, like weapons and the presidential motorcade. Air Force One is also often accompanied by what is called the Doomsday Plane, one of four Boeing E-4s, modified 747s. They are called Advanced Airborne Command Posts and often fly to a secondary airport close by to Air Force One in the case of an emergency, where it can, as its name suggests, serve as a command center from the skies. It functions also as a backup aircraft in case the main airplane runs into any trouble on the ground. Now, contrary to popular belief, Air Force One isn't typically accompanied by fighter jets. This is because most of the time, the temporary flight restriction posed around 30 nautical miles around its airspace is protection enough. And this airspace is obviously monitored closely, and fighter jets are only sent up if it is breached. But more often than not, fighter jets will accompany Air Force One more as a symbolic gesture for special occasions. First example of this was during the funeral of JFK, where 20 fighter jets from the Navy and 30 fighter jets from the Air Force accompanied Air Force One as a symbol of the States of the Union. Now, 
recently, back in September of 2020, the Air Force announced several contracts that they signed with aircraft manufacturers to make a supersonic presidential aircraft. But unfortunately, we are likely decades away from seeing that come to fruition. What is actually coming soon, though, is an Air Force One upgrade. So let's talk about that for a sec. The Air Force has announced starting 2024, the current aircraft will be replaced by 747-8Is. These two jets were purchased secondhand from a bankrupt Russian airline and is rumored to cost upwards of $5.3 billion for the entire program, and this includes building a new hangar at Andrews Air Force Base. And the plane's owner's manual alone cost $84 million. I mean, that's a pretty hefty price tag for paper that I discard by default. And for the most part, the functionality and performance of both aircraft are pretty similar. Some of its major upgrades include an extended fuselage, more fuel-efficient General Electric engines, and also a bulkier wing to store more fuel. But ironically, despite these optimizations, the new model actually has a slightly shorter range than the current 200B models. But of course, with aerial refueling, it doesn't really matter. But aside from that, the Air Force has kept the specs of this new plane tightly under wraps. So I guess I'll see you back here for part two in 2024. So hopefully after this video, you've learned something about Air Force One that you didn't know before. I know there are a lot of cool facts that I covered during this video, so let me know in the comments down below which one was your favorite, and also what kind of content you'd like to see from me coming up next. Now if you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up and also subscribing to my channel. Now I cover cool facts about a lot of other different planes here on my channel in a series called Airplane Anatomy, so make sure to go on over to check those out when you're done here. If you like learning about planes and want to support more independent creators like me, you should check out Nebula. It's an educational-ish video streaming platform where I'm joined by dozens of other females in STEM and fellow aviation creators like Real Engineering and Wenover Productions. I'm really happy to be a part of this platform where creators can experiment with our content without having to worry about demonetization or the algorithm. We've also partnered up with Curiosity Stream, a video platform with thousands of documentary films and TV series on everything from astrophysics to true crime. One of my favorites is Pioneers in Aviation, a series that deep dives into events in history that essentially created the field of aviation. Definitely check it out. And in addition to giving our viewers 26% off, you can get access to both platforms when you sign up for Curiosity Stream using the promo code JennyMa, all for less than $15 a year. If that sounds good to you, check out the link in the description. So thanks for tuning in guys, and I'll see you next time. They are what is called the they are what is called the advanced airborne they are what is called advanced they are what is called they are called now typically a C141 scar <laughs> typically a C130 typically a C141 scar <laughs> scar star star lifter cargo plane star lifter cargo plane typically a C141 star lifter cargo plane typically flat oh, oh.